Hey everybody, Paul Hickey here. Welcome to the Sports Card Strategy Show presented by NoOffSeason.com. We are sponsored today by MarketMoversApp.com by Sports Card Investor. You can save 20% now on MarketMoversApp.com by using the promo code NOOFFSEASON, all lowercase. And today I have my brilliant co host, Nathan Edward Murphy also known as the great Murphinus. It's an Nate honor to be here. I, Nate, it's, it's great to have you. This is something I've always wanted to do. And when I started creating sports card content about nine, nine months ago, um, I started hearing some podcasts and trying to understand what other people were doing content-wise in the, in the sports card hobby. And uh, I just thought, you know, you and I used to host a fantasy football show uh back in the yeah. day and we used to have in addition to the show we used to have just phone conversations every day and i was always so inspired by our phone conversations thinking god if this were if we could just record this and have it be a podcast um yeah so I, I feel like we finally get to it was do pre that. it was pre-podcast it was pre-record this um yeah it was uh it was pre anyone hearing it but the people that were at uh, norm's field of dreams where we actually did the show that's right norm's field of dreams we had a banner printed and we had i don't know Pretty maybe awesome. five to ten people in the audience and uh um, yeah. that's all we needed we actually that's all we needed matter. to have a great time yeah it, it didn't even matter how many people were there so um we are basically you and i have both sort of re-entered the sports card hobby if you will in at different levels uh everyone's kind of at their own level in the hobby anyway and we're getting back into it, at least for me, after about 30 years. You know, I started collecting cards when I was, uh, when I was about nine, eight or nine, maybe, and uh, just got back, back into it at age 39, just turned 40. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty rejuvenated at age 40 to, uh, to be back in the hobby. And uh, I'm just going to kind of run down the topics of today's show, uh, things we'll get to. Uh, we're going to keep it short, keep it quick. Um, and uh, keep it power packed. So I want to talk about, I want to ask you how you got into the hobby uh, originally and then like where you are now with it and what sort of intrigues you about it. And then I want to talk about, uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit of my story, but I won't go into that too much because I think a lot of people, um, I've put that content out there a lot and I don't really need to like mm -hmm. it. Uh, but I do want to segue after, after I hear your story, I want, I want to talk about the vintage card market because uh, I just kind of want to get your take on how uh, how you see sort of the the athletes who are the legends that you and I grew up watching, and I know you yeah. and your dad and your family like you you guys are huge, not only sports fans, but I actually consider you like one of the most knowledgeable people that I know about sports. And so I kind of want to get your take on that uh, on, yeah. on, the, on the old the old school guys, their cards. Yeah. Um, and then our, our old school guys. Yeah, our, our old school guys. I think that'll be fun because there's, you know, there's old school guys that our parents grew up watching, but then there's our guys. And so I think we can yep. hit on a little bit of both of that. And then I think it'll be fun to get into more of the modern card market topics. And that might be where I, um, you know, where I talk about some of the stuff that I've done and kind of, <clears throat> I, I may, I don't know how much you know about the modern card market. So I think it'll be fun to have that discussion and Maybe I'm educating you a little bit and getting your. You will be educating me, one hundred percent. So okay. um, there's no education on the modern day card market for me <laughs> at all. So this is this is interesting for me. You've kind of gotten me excited about uh, about talking about it again. I mean, even to the point where I spent about four hours at my mom and dad's house back in March, just seeing and remembering what I had. So it was it was fun, but uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to. Um, you know, to see what I've got, to see how um, that fits into today's, you know, card world. And, um, you know, how do you find the value in what you had from 30 some years ago? Um, that's kind of what I'm excited to hear about. So, but uh, I know that, you know, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about, about my card collection. So much like you growing up in, uh, in Michigan, southeastern Michigan, you know, you went to Tiger Games, right? Right. You know, I lived an hour or so away from Tiger Stadium. We went maybe three or four a year. Right. And um, so probably around 
probably around 84, 85, 86 is when I probably bought my first few packs of cards, right? It, no rhyme or reason, just buy some cello packs at the, at the Arbor Drugs there in, in, in my hometown in Tecumseh, Michigan for probably 45 cents and uh, open them up and then whatever happened to them happened to them, right? They ended up in a box, something. Probably around 88, I think we probably bought our first price guide. Okay. So then all of a sudden you're looking at your Don Mattingly's, right? Your Wade Boggs, and you're you're looking at maybe some uh, some Bo Jacksons from '86, '87, and you start saying, "Holy cow, these things are worth five dollars, ten bucks, like, yeah, wow. maybe, <laughs> exactly. yeah, maybe." Yeah. It, it was great, and um, so then all of a sudden, my dad and I just started going to card shows, and you know, I would take my birthday money, my Christmas money, you know, I would go to Michigan football games. And at the time you would collect cans after the game. So my dad and I would collect cans and we'd come, we'd walk back to the car with garbage bags full yes. of cans. And I'd take those to the same Arbor drugs and get myself 18, $20 that I would ultimately end up taking to a card show. So, you know, over time. And, um, but probably have mainly in the years that I have, it's probably between like 1988 and 1992, I would say. A, a mix of baseball, basketball, some football. I wasn't as much of a football fan then as what I am now and was when we were doing our fantasy football shows and, and talking every day. Um, and like a little bit of hockey. Um, the vast majority of what I have is honestly unopened because at the time, and this is something that I've kind of learned from you and just like little brief Google searches online at the time, the unopened was the more valuable thing, right? It, it was okay. Well, I got this box of 87 Fleer baseball cards. I've never opened them up. Who knows how many Barry Bonds are in there, right? There could be yep. 10, there could be zero. Um, but you took the chance, right? And um, so the bat, so even as a kid collecting in his 10 to 12 to 13, I was already thinking about the monetary value of what it could be, you know, down the road. It wasn't so much like, hey, there's my favorite picture of my favorite guy. It was, yeah. you know, how can I, how can I, you know, take advantage of this a, a little bit later? So that's the mostly what I got. When I go to my mom and dad's house, it's still boxes of unopened wax packs, um, cello packs. Um, and then once they started to have kind of the more metallic, like more higher quality than it's, it's like the upper deck cards back mm -hmm. in 89, they started to make a higher quality pack sealed and so forth. Couldn't really manipulate without knowing it. Um, that's basically what I got. A lot of, uh, I think I have some complete sets of Donruss tops, Fleer 80, 81 to 83, I think. I was, you know, I, I, was, I didn't have a job at, at eight, so I didn't have the money. So I don't have anything on the high-priced 84s, because there were some high-priced 84s, 85s, and 86s. So I kind of yeah. had, you know, those eight, early 80s. I didn't have any money. I was collecting cans for money. and but my dad has those. So between me and my dad, over the course of probably a four or five year period, we would probably go to a, uh, a card show every three months. That's awesome. What were the, so I love, the, I love the collecting cans for money and then buying sports cards with them. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and what, were, what, were the, what were the card shows like back then? No different than what you have now. I mean, I haven't been to one since probably 92, so I'm not really sure. However, I did watch your video on uh, nooffseason.com of you and Max going to it. So that was really yeah. cool. And what I saw was nothing different, really. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say that there was some differences. Um, there was no grading, right? Yeah. You looked at the edges and you said, okay, well, it's not bent. Right. Yeah. Right? They basically were just the corners and that was it. Yeah, it was the cor it was the corners, right? Yeah. And it was, do you have a gum mark on a top on the back or something <laughs> yeah, or, like that? 
I, or is there a crease? Did somebody crease? Yeah, a crease or something like yeah. that. But you still had the big cases full of individual cards. Um, I, I didn't really pay attention as much to your video, but there was more. There was a lot of boxes behind. You know, so you'd have the cards in the front, price tag on it, and you would negotiate. And I started doing that immediately. Um, you know, you come down to the end of the card show, right? You got 30 bucks left. But the thing you want is 40. Yeah. You got to bring it down. Yeah, you got to bring it down. Because you're not getting any money from me. That's right. He, he already spent his 100, 150 Good. or whatever. So you got to get them down. Because you only got 30 bucks and you're not walking home with 30 bucks left. You're going to walk home with something. So you learned how to negotiate. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, have a, you know, you don't get the box you want or you don't get the X, Y, or Z. So you learned about negotiation at that time and, and things like that. Um, it, there's probably some of this, if you went to a card show in Toledo, Ohio, or around Detroit or Jackson, probably some of the same characters that I was buying stuff from 30 years ago are there just a little grayer, you know, right now because yeah. they're, they're back into it. And, uh, and, and that's how it was. Yeah, it was a big circle, you know, a big room. You got a bunch of tables out here and you got a bunch of tables in the middle. You go and talk to people about baseball cards yep. or football, basketball. Yeah, and I found that uh, people were definitely willing to negotiate. Um, you got to look at it too. Like if, a, if a, somebody sets up a table and it's the end of the show, they don't necessarily yeah. want to – the same way that you want to get rid of your 30 bucks or your dad wants you to get rid of your 30 bucks, they don't want to go home with all their stuff uh, again. So yeah, they, they, they went there for a reason, wanted, right? They wanted to sell. Yeah, exactly. They want to sell some cards. You, know, you were asking me a little bit about my, my dad and I's collection. It's a mix of a lot of stuff. Um, there's some individual cards, mainly unopened boxes. We probably have between the two of us somewhere in the ballpark of 350,000 to 450,000 cards. The vast majority of those have never been touched by a human hand, period. That's amazing. And, you know, we have, we have packs that have a Barry Sanders rookie on the front, a Troy Aikman rookie on the back. The thing is open, unopened, but you can see it. You know, we've got um, a lot of, you know, as you, you look at now, we've got um, tons of boxes of 89, 89 upper deck, right? Ken Griffey Jr.'s rookie. Um, we got a bunch of basketball cards that you can kind of see through the packs and see that it's a Jordan card on the front, you know, of, of the pack and things. So we've got a lot of those that we kind of earmarked. Dan Marino, rookie card, second year card, things like that. Steve Young. It's got a lot of those, but the, we didn't buy a lot of individual stuff. We bought more volume, more than anything, and then didn't do yeah, anything with it. That's uh, something kind of fun to look into. I, I wanted to look into, like, out of those guys that you mentioned, like, who's selling, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of what price points they're at. And so the things that I've noticed is, like, um, you know, Griffey, uh, what I didn't really know about Griffey is that he was kind of everyone like he was my favorite player even though like Alan Trammell yeah. was my favorite tiger but Griffey was yeah. like my actual favorite player and what i didn't really realize was like just how how popular he was and and it's amazing that he's still super popular like when i got back into the hobby uh in february of, of 2021 so just about about yeah. 8 months ago um i started looking at griffey cards and noticed cuz i had like a sort of beat up um 1989 Don Russ rated rookie and uh, oh, yeah. I, I didn't think it was going to grade very high. So I started looking at like, okay, what other Griffey cards could I go get? And obviously that upper deck 1989, there were a ton of those printed, but it's one of the more iconic cards. And that's still yeah. on eBay. Like just, okay, just that card, just the, the Griffey upper deck rookie uh, is consistently selling for between 40 and $50 ungraded. And so like, so one of the things I want to talk about is like, who out of those guys is selling? And I mean, every day, multiple times that card is selling. So if you've yeah. got, you know, if, if you, and you're saying you personally uh, likely have boxes with that card in it. Uh, oh, we have at least, with that card we have it, at least um, seven to 10 of those completely unopened boxes from 89. So, so 30 packs in every, every box. Now, let's take that a step further. Let's say, now a PSA 10 is actually super hard to get, but a PSA 10 sold yesterday for uh, $2,459.68 in an auction on eBay. 
and yeah. you've got uh you've got you know that that's that's not uncommon like twenty one hundred mm-hmm. twenty five dollars a day before that et cetera et cetera so like yeah. what what have, have you and your dad talked about what the plan is for those those unopened boxes because you had the foresight back in nineteen eighty nine to keep them sealed and here we are in twenty twenty one going into twenty twenty two What's the plan? Are you handing those down to your son, to his grandson? What, what, what are you guys going to do with it? You know, it's funny. I, I don't know. I mean, I live in Phoenix, as you know. Um, you know, to get those things out here would be quite the haul, be quite the effort to be able to get all those out. Um, you know, when this all kind of started, you know, the, 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 the card craze all of a sudden came back. I mean, think about this, Paul. The card craze ended in 92, 93. Like it was over. Yeah, And it didn't really have any steam for 30 years. No steam, period. Yep. So, you know, we always laughed about it, how much money we had spent into these. And we're like, it's just the sunk cost. So now, yeah. I, I'll be honest, I've talked to my dad and I said, you know, because this is his summertime up in Michigan. And he bikes 100 miles a day. So he doesn't have time to do all this stuff. But I told him, I said, Dad, you really ought to look in the winter when you're kind of shut in a little bit more and start looking at what you got. Cause I told him, I said, it's kind of evolved a little bit. This is something I'll learn from you as we continue to do some of these shows is where's the value today. Um, and how do you find that value in your, in your card collection? I told him in the winter, what you should think about doing is talk. Let's talk to Paul and let's find out where's your value. You know, what do you have? Yeah. That's good. You know, do we decide to open a box of those, pick out the ones that we likely should get graded and see what the, where the value is in in some of these things. Because if you got four or five Griffies right there, be kind of nice to cash in on a 30, 35, $50 box back in 89, 90, 91, turn it into a 1500 or more. So that'd be kind of cool. Because I go, Super you cool. have, my dad's almost 70. He doesn't have 30 more years to wait for the next wave of card craze. And, uh, you know, I'll be 70s by the time that that could happen if it does it again. So, yeah. So, so there's a lot of people. This, this is interesting because there's a lot of people now. I mean, um, the, the hobby is, is like exploding. And so there's people that are trying to flip these, these, um, vintage cards but the mm-hmm. problem with that is you you have to acquire them if you don't already have them where you and your dad are in a perfect position you guys already have them there's no overhead cost to acquiring them yeah and and you can sell them for around a hundred dollars a piece without even putting any money into grading them and then if you yeah. put, you might put um like psa right now the lowest submission level unfortunately is $250 per card so economically you're kidding make that much sense no PSA actually I that's insane so you you don't even bother submitting a card unless you look at it and say man there's nothing wrong with this but you could submit it for 250 they're looking at something you never thought of as a collector from the 90s right yeah. And you could submit it for 250 and literally have a $175 card. Is that fair? Oh yeah. Absolutely. This is, this so, blows my mind just to let you know, this yeah. blows my mind. This is why I wanted to do this. Yeah. So, so that's, that's an issue and that people need to think about because what, what's really interesting is that um, back in February, I submitted a significant amount of cards to PSA, but it was at the $12 per card level. And then literally yeah. three weeks later, they shut everything down. Well, first they increased their, doubled their pricing. That didn't help uh, slow things down. They needed to try to slow things down. That didn't help. So then they shut down all grading levels except for the top grading level. The plan is that they're going to open up again like a more economy grading level where you can get things graded for maybe $20 or $30 a card. Now, another strategy for the Griffies could be there's another company, the number two company right now um, is SGC, and that's uh, some people might debate me on that, but the number two company right now is SGC. They're really the only ones that are open for business um, that will uh, that have um, a good, solid, long-term reputation of grading like vintage cards and modern cards, and they have resale value. So, like, if, mm-hmm. if and it's thirty dollars a card, so you could send the seven Griffies 
that would be a safer bet to send the seven Griffies to SGC, knowing they're going to sell the minimum grade they would get would probably be an eight or an eight five. And yeah. Comes, uh, fresh out of the pack. And, and you're not going to be underwater on any of those. You're going to get, you're going to spend a total of, you know, 21. Yeah. I mean, you spent, you spent $210, you spent $210 bucks to bucks. get seven. Yeah. So we could do the yeah. math on that. I mean, basically you guys would profit somewhere between you'd make $75 to $1,500 per card, depending on the grade. So the thing, the thing about it is there's, I think there's a lot of people like uh, in your and your dad's position that might be like, well, why would I do this? I was actually at a friend of ours house uh, this summer and he had a Griffey sitting there and it was in pretty good condition. It was in a shoe box. He had it in a, in a screw down case. It was in a shoe box. And I, I said, like, what are you going to do with this? And he just goes, huh, and just tossed it back into the shoe box. Now, to me, that's no fun. Like, I get what he's, I, 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 I get that, like, he's, he doesn't care. Like, to him, a couple hundred dollars doesn't make that much of a difference. To me, it's not about the couple hundred dollars profit so much as it the is game. about the game of how, like, I actually picked up cans at a, at a Michigan football game, went to Arbor Drugs, bought a pack, took something out of the pack, sent it, you know, like 30 years later, sent it in to get grading, to get well, grading. Right. And my total overhead cost for this is $30 and 10 cents plus the shipping or whatever it is. And then I got the grade back. And now, I mean, to me, so back to your dad's situation and your situation with these unopened open boxes, um, it's fun. So if a 70 year old man and his, his, you know, his son and his, in his uh, early forties, just want to have some fun together. Like, it, it, I mean, I've had more fun in the last probably year doing this, going through and getting uh, hundreds of cards graded. And then mm. now I'm kind of, I'm kind of in a situation where I'm, I'm figuring out the modern cards, but, uh, but just to kind of wrap up the discussion on the vintage cards, like um, this is not going to shock anyone, uh, but like Michael Jordan is any, my, any graded Michael Jordan card from, 1980s, even his second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, any, any graded Jordan card from 86 or 87, it could be a two, a three. I mean, it could be like a really low grade, yeah. not in that graded condition. It's going to sell for over a hundred dollars. Um, and yeah, I was looking at the, what the app that you sent me and, um, I was looking at a few of those. I mean, even like ridiculous Jordan cards. I mean, ridiculous yeah. one, like Sam Vincent, Hoops card. The Sam with Vincent Jordan, hoops card. With Jordan wearing number twelve. I'm not kidding you, Paul. I probably got twenty five of those. Yeah. And I yeah. just thought it was cool. I'm like, oh, because you know me, huge Bulls fan. Yeah. I mean, I could have written the documentary, The Last Dance. You know, um, I, I know everything about that team and and all, and so forth. I have multiple nine things. You know, nine sleever binder pages with just that Sam Vincent number 12 Jordan card. Yeah. Not so that's like, I mean, it, so that one goes yeah. for like $120. Yeah. I mean, you could sell those because those in, those in PSA 10, um, which I've got, I think I've got four of those that I submitted for $12 a pop to PSA and I'm waiting mm -hmm. to get them back. The PSA 10s are selling for, 153 to $210. I mean, it's over 200 over $200 for a Sam Vincent card. Now right now that is, you wouldn't that send is more that than Sam Vincent's net worth. <laughs> is the card I mean, that has a Jordan number 12 from a jersey store. Yep. Right? So anything so it doesn't shock anybody but the re, I I wanted to make the point that Jordan is a if you're looking at vintage cards and you're thinking um and and vintage like in our vintage, right? So we're thinking like Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Dr. J. We're also thinking about guys like Frank Thomas. We're thinking about guys like Bo Jackson. We're thinking about um, Barry Bonds. You know, yeah, Barry Bonds, Barry Sanders. I mean, those guys. You're looking at the you're looking at the Hall of Famers from our era. Even honestly, even a guy like Calvin Johnson, who's like not not that vintage, is like considered vintage slash modern right now, and he just got into the Hall of Fame. So you're you're looking at these these vintage. guys that. 15 retiree. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, Joey Harrington, you know, you might even want to look up a Joey Harrington yeah. card. Every once in I got a while. song about him. You do you do, but we'll save that for another show. Hopefully we'll get, we'll get some requests for that song in another show. Yeah, I'm sure um, you will. 
But, uh, but I, another thing is to wrap up the vintage discussion, the point is my advice right now is that back in February, people were reaching for these fringe legends, right? And their card prices spiked. And in, in February and March, and even a little bit of April 2021, uh, everyone's card was worth a ton of money. You could get an Emmett Smith, a Michael Irvin, J- Jerry Wright. I mean, these guys are legit players, but they're like, they're fringe legends. Like, you know what I mean? And they're not, they're not Jordan. Well, they're not Tom Jerry Brady. Jerry Rice. Is, like, you know, I, mean, I mean, well, Jerry, Jerry Rice is, but like um, some of these other guys are not necessarily going to be like in the top two of their position or three. And the, they might be in the top 10. That's great. My point yeah. is that like everyone in the top 25 of their position in every sport was their prices were through the roof, um, you know, six yeah. months ago. Now they're not. So, so the advice to the, to the people watching and listening here is that if you're into the vintage thing, you got to be very, very careful. Uh, I would advise if you're in Nate's situation or Nate's dad's situation, have some fun, like go through some of this and look at a, look at a company like SGC to get your cards graded for $30 a, a card. Look at the ones like you said, Nate, that like have good centering. Uh, if they're coming out of the pack, if they're coming out of the box, they're going to be, they should, they shouldn't have any mix or anything like that on them, right. but um, they should grade high. So like, but be very careful if you have these in a case and they're not necessarily that you like you opened it, but they're, you don't remember what you did before you put it in the case. Um, it might not grade high and you might lose money. And, uh, it could still be fun in the process, but I think like if you have unopened boxes like you and your dad, I mean, yeah. that's something I would love to do that with you guys on another show, figure out the logistics of how we would, we could yeah, we can do a, help we can, him make yeah, decisions. Call it a box break or something like that. We yeah. could do something. Like that. So let me help. ask you this here. You were ta- just to go along the same thing with grading. You said, Hey, you don't know what you did before that so when they're grading these i mean are they looking for like things like a fingerprint on these cards i mean you know i I mean i understand the corners the sense brightness the clarity of the card i can think of a you know of a frank thomas that i have that is you know an 89 tops the one where he looks like a freaking middle linebacker you know um you know the card i'm talking about um you know it's it's blurry right? It's just a bad printing day at tops, you yes. know? And, but then I got one that's right next to it. That's like crisp. It's perfect. But are they looking at things like a fingerprint that will take the grade down from a 10 to an eight? I mean, what, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, it, you say, Hey, it comes out of the pack unless it's a quote unquote bad print day. And it's just horribly off center. And you can tell it with the naked eye. I mean, is it pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be an eight, nine or a 10 and, and how, what are the percentage of eighties cards, early nineties cards that come out of the pack and grade out at a 10? Yeah. Cause that's where all the- it, it used to be eyeball it. That's mint. Great. Yeah, exactly. Not and that, that, that's where I think like if you're okay. So fingerprints, my understanding uh, from some of the research I've done around SGC specifically is that they've come out and said that they're not going to necessarily like the, they'll actually sort of somewhat clean your card for you to make sure that you're not downgraded for things like fingerprints, because those aren't necessarily uh, permanent flaws in the card. Mm-hmm. But what, so that that's kind of the fingerprint thing, which is a good question. Um, I think the other, uh, I can't really speak exactly for like PSA or any of the other grading companies. That's just a representative from SGC on a video said, you know, I, we don't, we're not going to downgrade your grade for a fingerprint. Like if it wipes off, uh, we'll wipe it off for you. That kind of thing. Some people do actually clean their cards. I, I have never, I have, I've been too scared to put anything on a card. I've always wanted to just go straight from the thing into the, into the penny save and the card saver and send it in. Um, But, but they do look for, like you said, like any imperfection that could be totally out of your control. So it was a bad, like the, 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 the printer, uh, the coloring isn't as good uh, for whatever reason. It was a bad print day. On a home run stat on the back. Yeah, definitely off. Yeah, def- definitely, you know, centering edges, color, uh, different things like that. Also, 
like the, the Jerry Rice rookie, uh, since we mentioned Jerry Rice a minute ago, uh, has like, I believe it's 1986 tops has like a green border. So yeah. some of it is the design into how well the card grades. So for example, like that green border is hard to not see a white mark. Uh, whereas if you have a white border, um, it's got a slight you might blemish. Not see, yeah, you might not right. see something. Now these grading companies have technology that are out of this world right now um hmm. i actually let me grab this card real quick so i'm posting this in another video soon but i have this yeah. michael jordan skybox oh I, I i sent you photos of of, of a couple of mine when i was and if at you home. look and and i bought this from someone online and yeah. i bought it and it was in another holder it was in a um just a really non-reputable grading company holder and okay. I, and PSA has this service called cross grading where you can send it in. They'll crack the slab of the other grading company and they'll grade it for you. But okay. P, so I originally, this is in an SGC holder right now. I originally mm -hmm. sent this into PSA. They sent it back to me saying it was altered and there was evidence of trimming. And when I look at the card, I, I cannot tell that the card was trimmed. Um, okay. But so I cracked, so PSA didn't even crack the slab from the other grading company. They had technology. It was, they were able to look, examine through the other slab, tell that it was for sure trim, send it back to me. I cracked it That's out of crazy. that slab. Yeah. So I cracked it out of that slab, sent it into SGC. SGC put it in their slab, but it's, you see it says A here for altered. So I just have this as like, this is my one card that I have, my one graded card that I have in my possession. The rest of them are in a vault, which we can talk about later. Um, but this is a... Uh, this is a Alt. reminder, Nate, to me as to how hard grading is and how I really don't know with the naked eye what it's going to grade. I have to make my decisions, my grading decisions based on who's the player, is the player worth grading, and mm -hmm. is the brand of the card. So we'll talk more about this maybe a little bit today, but definitely in future shows. Um, is the brand of the card worth grading? Because now... It'll blow your mind how many brands of cards that Panini and Tops have. It's a ridiculous amount of brands. Like there's a release every yeah. week of a different brand. See, that's confusing um, to me. I just want to yeah. stick to like Series One, Series Two, 1990. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's. All right. So, so good vintage stuff. Good grading questions. There's definitely more we want to get into in future shows on all of that. And you can always drop a comment below, and I'll answer your grading question and. Uh, and I'm always happy to, to do more videos as well to uh, in, dive into specific topics that we might miss on the show. But um, I wanted to talk, to, I, I, we need to get at least 10 to 15 minutes in on this before we wrap up today's show. And it okay. is, who's hot right now? I'm going to throw out these names to you. I'm going to get your reaction. And then we're going to have a bit of a discussion as to why they're hot right now. And it'll, give, it'll, it'll start to give you an idea of what it's like to be in the current modern card market and why in my mind it's pretty much a more fun version of fantasy sports and maybe sports betting little zoolander right who's hot yep. right now okay who's hot right now so who's I, I, hot I, right I, now I'm taking, I'm taking notes i'm taking who's notes hot right now some of these i'm guys. gonna i'm gonna name out all the names and then we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about kind of the right. reasons as to why all right let's do mac it jones Who? mac jones Mac Jones. Yeah, great. Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. Clearly. Justin Fields. Yeah. Emmanuel Quickly. Now, again, it's, it's September. It's early September. It's September 3rd when we're, we're talking today. Uh, a guy named Bol Bol. Like it. Killian Hayes. Okay. Famous Jameis Winston. Wow. Teddy the he's been, Bridge he's Bridgewater. Been on this list twice. Yep, he has. Teddy the Bridge Bridgewater. I'm not sure that was ever really his nickname, but it might be on this show now. Nope. I, no, uh, I... Wander Franco. And yeah. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Do you remember Vlad Vlad Guerrero the senior? Got plenty of those cards, Paul. Don't you worry about it. Well, Vlad, the old okay, well, expos for sure. Yep, don't, that's right. don't you so, worry. 
so the senior we might we'll, we'll get into him in a different show but his son Vlad Jr. is on fire so let's talk about why this is right so Mac Jones was the 15th overall pick in the draft this year quarterback from Alabama to the New England Patriots the the Patriots uh, I'm sure you know this but they just cut Cameron Newton and Mac Jones is now the starter in New England so his card prices fact are that news is crazy like come on we knew this yeah, yeah. So I want to get your take on, on Mac Jones in a minute. But I'm just going to kind of round out the rest of this list by saying, because Trevor and Justin Fields are in the same, the same um, ballpark as Mac. They're the rookie quarterback yeah. with a lot of hype. Um, and then you've got these other guys, and you're probably wondering, like, why are their cards hot? Uh, and the, I've got one phrase for you. Yeah. The hype machine. Love it. We invented the hype machine. The hype machine we invented in the Crew Fantasy Football League about circa 2003, and it was yeah. all about how we could get someone else in our league to trade for the player that we were hyping up. And it would That's take exactly weeks, of effort, weeks of effort of every article. Hey, who's the greatest hype machine success of all time? Arian Foster. I hyped that guy up when he went from the practice squad. Never I'm glad traded you mentioned him. Arian. I'm glad you mentioned Arian Foster, Nate, because the hype machine ended up being warranted with Arian Foster. He had like three or four really good seasons in the NFL, which most running backs of his caliber do, and then they peter out. So what you have right now in the modern card market, 99% of these guys are going to be Arian Foster, right? Like they're going to they're gonna have a 15 no, no, well, minutes. Be, I mean, 1% might have three great seasons. Um, yeah but it's yeah, but it's not i'm trying to think of a matt jones another m jones yeah. is a great example of the hype machine you know lawrence maroney was another yep. great example guys who never were right so exactly that's exactly um, see this is exactly why i wanted you to co-host this show with me because you understand that like what would todd Gurley's card be worth right now nothing He's not Nothing. on. He's two years ago. he's not on a team. Yeah, two years yeah. ago when he was a rookie. Whenever there's hype around a player, okay, that's All when right. their card is relevant. That's when their card. So you've got. So why is Emmanuel quickly and Bowl Bowl and Killian Hayes on this list? This may shock you. The NBA Summer League, the NBA Summer League, doesn't they shock dominated. Me. They dominated, and their card prices. And this is why I love this. This is okay. why this is making me love sports more than I ever have. And you know, in, right. I've had some phases in my life where I've had some love for sports. You've had some love. So you've got Teddy Bridgewater named the starter in Denver. Yeah. If you've got Teddy Bridgewater right now, if you have his cards, you've got to just sell them. You've got Jameis uh, Winston. Yeah. You've got Jameis Winston cards. You've got to sell them right now. You know, um, not like so. Wander Franco and Vlad Guerrero; those are young MLB guys that are on fire right now. They're super young. Wander's are in his first year. Vlad Junior's in his third year. I mean, I'm not saying sell those guys, but like, actually, their card. We know what Teddy are, Bridgewater is, right? Right. I, I mean, what you're telling me right now, Paul, and I'll be honest because I I have not. When it comes to sports cards, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about 30 years ago. I am not thinking about today. But what you're telling me right now is something that I don't think there was any market for in sports cards five years ago. You're exactly right. It's, and, it's and, exactly what we talked about at a restaurant in Cincinnati, Ohio, not too long ago. It was a game, right? And it was a stock market game that we would play based off of hype, and things like that, and you would play based off someone's worth. Instead of it just being a fictional worth and, a, and an increase and things like that, based on the website we were speaking about developing, we're talking about a physical asset to where you can go to a Walmart or whatever and, and buy. And if you get one, the hype machine creates the value. And if you're not high on the guy long term, like a quick or like a a Teddy Bridgewater, or you know that Winston's just going to throw, throw 31 interceptions again and be the backup next year somewhere else, you get rid of it right now. And this is not something, this is kind of blowing my mind right now that you're talking about yeah. this because 
Now all of a sudden, I mean, juices are getting flowing to me. Yeah, I'll go out and buy a pack or two that I haven't done in 30 years. So before you go, so you nailed it. And before you go buy a pack, I want you to go to a website called starstock.com. And I want, okay. you to put 10, I want you to put $10 in there. And when you put $10 in there, make sure that you use the referral code, all lowercase, no off season. Okay. Because it will give you another $10 for free. So you'll have $20 and you'll, like be able to, you'll be able to browse the cards that are for sale. And okay. you, can day, you can day trade cards on starstock.com and you do not have to have the physical card. You will own the card, but it'll be okay. in a portfolio <laughs> yeah. in your account. And you, can port, and, then, and you can go buy cards from someone else's portfolio. You can send in your own physical cards yeah. when they're in your portfolio. Or you can buy, like if, if you think, like, so actually this is a perfect segue into the next segment. Because I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions, try to get some predictions yeah. out of you. Yeah. You're probably going to need to stop in the next 10 minutes and we can, we can continue this in another show. It's all good. But we're here yeah, about time. I want, I want you, I want your predictions as uh, someone who's super knowledgeable about sports. And then if you think any of these guys, if you believe in your predictions, you can go to star stock and you can kind of put your money where your mouth is a little bit. And you can buy one of these guys cards for maybe a few dollars. And then when these things happen, three weeks to three months to six months from now, yeah. uh, you might have 10 X your, you know, your return potentially. Um, now, Man. Starstock's not the only place where this is happening. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to throw them out there because they're exactly what you said about when we had that conversation at the We were so far ahead of our time. Yeah, exactly. So, it's just we didn't, um, the, we didn't have the quality name of Starstock.com. That's right. Well, and we didn't have the foresight to understand anything about sports cards at that point. Right. We were, that's right. The, 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 it wasn't happening. But it was a it was, fun this, conversation. This, this wasn't happening. This, this was not happening right. at that time. No. Um, no. I was playing FanDuel and DraftKings, which I think I won some money on a, on a 1 p.m. Uh, bet that day, uh, yeah. thanks to the Bengals. But anyway, all right. So Tony Romo said that uh, Zach Wilson has the skills and ability to be like a Patrick Mahomes. And so I want to get to your – your take maybe not only on that, but also some predictions for this year. Because I think that uh, if, if, if we as sports fans and as card collectors and, 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 card, and sports card investors now, <clears throat> is really what we are, uh, if we're playing the modern day trading card market and we feel the conviction that Tony Romo speaks out and puts his reputation on the line and says, Zach Wilson can be the next Patrick Mahomes potentially. Yeah. Would we not buy Zach Wilson cards like crazy and then two years from now have cards that are worth, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars depending on the card that we had? So I want to, so, so give me your take on that. First of all, maybe that comment yeah. by Tony Romo and, and the, uh, the overall concept of that. And then I'll get into my rapid fire here. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Here's what I, here's what I always say. You remember this line Hicks. We don't know anything about this guy, okay? Um, we, don't. we don't. We don't know anything about him until he gets to deal with defenses. You, you know what my thought process is about predicting quarterbacks is, first off, a defensive, a good defensive coordinator will always figure out a way to not shut down a quarterback, but to find their weakness. And I'm, so I look at um, – you know, I, I got it. It's slipping my mind of uh, the quarterback in, in like Philadelphia. Um, Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts. There's, an, there's not enough tape on a guy like that yet, but there will be. And we'll find the weaknesses. He came out. He's got a lot of different optionality in his game, um, very much similar to the prediction by, by, um, by Romo. Um, there's a lot of optionality in that particular game. Um, but you got to find out. Ultimately, what's the weakness? Where do we want to try to, uh, to, to limit their production in? So I think quarterbacking is just really, really hard. Because if you think about it, some of the still the great, the, the, the best quarterbacks in the game three years ago were in their 30, 35 to 36 to 40 year old range. 
they're timeless talents, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not really big on the quarterback prediction inside of the first 25 games that they play. So I just look at it and go, whatever. Um, but yeah. who, do I tr- who do I trust? I trust Josh McDaniels and I trust Bill Belichick. Okay, Matt Jones great. To be just, just <clears throat> okay, so, fine. So that kind of so answers, I think, my next it's question. It's Lawrence, timeless. And I'll tell you who I kind of like a lot, who I think is going to be pretty good. Their, their consistency, their accuracy, the fact that they played in seven big games <clears throat> every year, and they played in a, in a kind of a traditional NFL offense. I really like Justin Fields a lot. Love it. And, I, and, and now I like him way more than like a Hurts. Um, I just – I never was impressed by Hurts at Alabama. Just never was. I felt like when your wide receiver has seven yards of room, seven yards of space, you and I could fit it in that hole. Yeah. Right? So I just feel like there's not enough tape left. But as far as some of those guys, Jones, Field, Lawrence, I think the, 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 the talent is there. Now, none of those guys have Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is – he's incredible. He really is. You can tell the way the way that the ball comes out of the hand is Rogers esque. You know, a few years yeah. ago, the the talent is ridiculous. So I don't like when guys like Romo come out and say he's like Pat. Nope. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Doesn't come out the same way. the The Nate Murphy eye test tells you that's not even close, my friend. It doesn't yeah. come out as tight as accurate. The spin on that ball, it just looks different. It's like when Tiger was hitting drivers in 2000. It just looks different. And um, sorry, yeah, Tony, sure. you're not right. But if you got his cards, go buy some and sell them, I guess. Apparently, that's what I'm learning right now, is if Tony well, Romo yeah, I mean, them, buy the cards, sell the card. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Get rid of your – if you got Zach Wilson cards, sell them now. If you've got Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Mac Jones, you got a good chance of holding them through some success. And Justin Fields will get a bump after Andy Dalton sucks in the first couple of weeks, and they put him in the lineup. He'll get another yeah. – he'll get yeah. a bump in card value. So let me ask you, four point. bad games, does the card price go down these days? For a guy, yes, it does. It absolutely okay. does. But for, and but that's, for a guy, that's all I was wondering. That's, that's me just throwing a rapid fire yeah. at you. So I know that that wasn't a part of the show. So give me – keep the rapid fire going toward, towards myself here. All right. That's, that's well, we got time for one more rapid fire, and then I got to wrap <laughs> it up because we got a baseball practice in the family that I got to get to. So yeah, um, you Max. Who, who are the top – four NFL teams at the end of the season? Who are, who are the, in the conference championship games? And then who wins the Super Bowl? All right. And then conference I'm going to add a card games. twist to this in the okay. write-up on the show page. Okay. Um, barring injury to, to Mahomes, I mean, there's no reason that the Chiefs aren't going to be there. Um, absolutely no reason at all. I'm going to throw one out there. And I'm not, sh- I'm not sure, you know, the fans are going to agree with it. But I think, I think Roethlisberger's got one more good season left. All right. I think he's got one more good season. I know the offensive line isn't what it should be. Um, the defense, you just never know. Um, but the defense is young. They're, they're solid. I think Pittsburgh is going gonna, is, is gonna to be there as well. So I think those are two teams that I really like. Um, in, the, in the NFC – I mean, this is chalk, baby. I, I mean, it's Aaron Rodgers. It's the Green Bay Packers. And hmm. you know what? I'm going to go with my former hometown team. I'm going to go with Seattle Seahawks. You know, you quarterbacks run the league, barring injury. Those two teams are going to be there. I've been at three amazing Seahawks Packers game at uh, what is now I don't even know what this, the field is called former Century Link. Those two teams are going to be in the at, at the end in the uh, in the conference finals. All right, real quick, Super Bowl champion. Green Bay Packers. All right, so what my takeaway for card collectors there is Najee Harris. 
stays healthy, could be a good buy. And then in the Steelers playoff run. And then also you've got guys like Devontae Adams. You've got guys like DK Metcalf, Russell Wilson, even Aaron Rodgers and Pat Mahomes cards would continue to rise in Nate's scenario. And big Ben Roethlisberger might be a buy because then he's going to retire and then he's going to get inducted in the hall of fame. And so his card prices could rise. Everybody. Thank you so much, Nate. Loved having you on. We're going to do this again. We'll announce the show schedule once you and I figure it out. This has been yeah. the sports card strategy show presented by NoOffSeason.com, sponsored by Market Movers app by Sports Card Investor. Everybody, thanks and have a great day. Thank you.